Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 161 of Love at First Scent with me, Percy Lays, coming to you today live from YouTube. And it's another one of our live interview episodes today. And I have got somebody very, very special lined up for you. Somebody whose work I would be willing to say that if you have been in a, in a, in a major European city or maybe North American city and perhaps probably even Eastern city in the last few years, you will have smelled her work at some point, even though you may not have been aware that you were smelling her work and you may not even have bought her work, but you will have picked up a whiff of it in the air as you go through a shopping mall. Because our guest today is Emma Dick, the current in-house perfumer at none other than Lush. So we're going to be talking to her about the creation of these scents here, what the brand calls the Renaissance Collection. But we may also be going down memory lane with her and talking about some of the scents from the brand's past and also what it's like to create, um, dare I say for want of a more accurate term, really quite high quality perfumes for a brand that is very, very high street and in many ways very affordable and very accessible. So. With no further ado, let please welcome to the uh, Persolay's YouTube studio, Emma Dick. Hello. And you are coming to us live from pool, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> yes, live from glamorous pool. Here I am. <laughs> uh, why don't you explain where you are, actually? Well, currently, um, so we have uh, Inventors Labs in Pool. That's where I create the perfumes. Um, but currently, the other inventors are in the lab and they might be a little bit noisy. So I had to try and find a quiet space. So I'm kind of in a meeting space upstairs away from the other guys, um, just so that we can hear them shouting all phone calls. The, the thing that I'm most drawn by is this, is, is that lots of orange teapots that I see in the background? Are you heavy tea drinkers <laughs> over there? Well, I think a lot of the founders, they tend to have um, kind of board meetings in this room. So there's definitely lots of cups available at all times. Um, yeah, but you're, if, I, if I'm doing this, it's because the sensor has gone off and the lights go off. So I am here. You're just, if I I'm waving, I'm not waving at anyone. I do love that in the sort of five, 10 minute pre-chat that Emma and I had before we went live at one point, the lights went out and she had to sort of, well, you had to, you had to wave your ha uh, arms, didn't you? So there's going to be lots of semaphore. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll just assume you're sending secret messages to some, to some lush fans out there who understand the symbols. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. I will, of course, be taking your questions in the usual way at some point. Hang on to them for the moment. Start thinking of some good questions you'd like to put to Emma. And remember, when you do ask your questions, if you can, it's always really, really great to find out where you are watching from. We've got Flackerness, who's already tuned in from Germany and says, how great. I love Lush. Um, Angela, regular viewer, who I know is based in the UK, is saying, welcome, Emma. Nubianet, another regular viewer, is saying, hello from rainy Northern California. Wow, you're not allowed to have rain in California, are you? Anyway, we are in the middle of yet another lockdown, Emma. So mm -hmm. if you had to create a perfume that somehow sums up the lockdown experience, what would its central note or accord be? Um, it's a tricky one. I think everybody needs a bit of happiness in their lives. So maybe it would be quite never narrowly heavy, um, uh, uplifting citrus, just anything to sort of lift and lighten the mood. I think the first lockdown seemed a bit easier. The weather was nice. Um, you know, we could get out in the garden. Um, but obviously now when it's you know short days and cold days it's hard to get out of the house and so definitely a sort of bright cheery type of blend I would so say. So you, you go for something to kind of counter the lockdown mood rather than to okay right now you have been at Lush correct me if I'm wrong for something in the region of 20 years now haven't you? Yes I have. For my but sins. you haven't you haven't always been a perfumer at Lush. So tell us, how did, how did, how did you get into the Lush game? Well, actually, um, so I my family home is quite close to the Lush factories. 
So I remember my mum saying we used to have like a family allowance. So I'd finished my GCSEs and I was at home and her family allowance was about to stop. And she said, you need to go and get a job. So I said, oh, okay. So I just walked over to the industrial estate, walked into Lush and, and sort of said, oh, can I have a job? And they said, yes. Um, so I literally started as a Christmas temp. I was labeling pots and bottles, oh, wow. um, putting shampoos into the bottles. I'm still, I like to think that I'm still quite good at it, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, and then I, I kind of went into, uh, and I sort of started to work with Simon. So he worked in our perfume compounding department. And I kind of went into that department and we started to work together. So we created a uh, quality control system for our essential oils and absolutes. Um, and then- okay, hang, on, hang on, how do you go from being a Christmas temp to creating a quality control system? <laughs> well, I, I kind of managed the department. So we had an export department where we sent out the shampoos and creams, et cetera. And I managed that department and it was in a really small building. So everybody kind of knew each other. So I'd like to think that Simon and the other guys that were working in there saw the potential of my work ethic and kind of asked me to join them. So instead of being the manager of the department that makes the shampoos, I then became a person that um, just compounded the fragrances for Lush. Um, so yeah, we began to work together. Um, so but had, then had you, had you until this point, uh, or at this point been a perfume fan or even a Lush fan for that matter? Not originally, no, no, not at all. I that Lush originally was a job and and they kept me on and um yeah I found it obviously I found it much more interesting when I went into um the compounding part of it because you know it's really uh high quality expensive materials you had to be really careful we were going through a process of we kind of established that a lot of our high-end materials were being adulterated so then it kind of began a learning process um of what you know what people were using to adulterate things um so that so, was how, how did you that's an interesting story there so did you did you start sort of comparing them with others or running tests on yeah. them or we compared them with others we did um like third party tests um which kind of reconfirmed that we were um buying adulterated material but also we were in a position where we we purchased really high volume high value like the lush is um, growth steadily increased and we realized that we could go directly to source um, instead of the middlemen and because we tend to find that it was the middlemen that would cut those materials um, you know to try and make the money their sort of margins um, so then we started to go direct to source um, to kind of know what we were buying where it was coming from visiting the different places where it was growing dealing with the people building relationships Gosh, that's fascinating. So keep us going through your story then. How, how do you, you know, so where, when did you get to the point where you actually, well, A, I suppose, started making some of the perfumes and B, became the perfumer? Well, I, I sort of had various jobs through the business. So when we had Be Never Too Busy To Be Beautiful, I went in there almost as a stock controller to try and reduce stocks. I was a natural raw materials buyer, so I bought things like shea butter, jojoba oil. I then, then moved into essential oils buying, so I was the buyer of essential oils and uh, absolutes. So I would visit these places with a colleague. I used to visit with them when um, I studied, when we were putting together the quality control. And then um, I became senior management of the manufacturing section of the business. And then I had uh, I had my first child and I couldn't do the travel anymore. And I remember being at um, a conference, uh, we had a conference in Bournemouth and it was the launch of a gorilla show. And it was when we had the set in stone, there was a, a piece of music that was created and they played it live at this uh, this event. And I sort of thought, I've been around this for so long. Um, and I kind of knew the intricacies of the materials. I've been so exposed to them. And I thought, I wonder if I'd be any good. You know, I, I don't class myself as a, I didn't class myself as a creative person. I can't paint. 
you know, so I sort of, I had, obviously I had a close relationship with Simon because I've worked with him for a long time. And I just sort of said, oh, I wonder if I could do this. And he said, oh, come in, see dad. And then they sent me off to make a perfume and come back. And they gave me some very constructive criticism. And then I think Simon was either on a work trip or a sabbatical and his dad called and said, we're open in Oxford Street. We've got tons of products that we need to fill the shop with. Can you come and work on the perfumes? So that's kind of how it began. So have you ever had formal, in inverted commas, formal perfumery training? No, not at all. That's amazing. So it's all on the job. Yes, definitely all on the job. I mean, I started a perfumery course. Um, this was when sort of in the earlier days when we created the quality control system, um, but I never completed it. It was really boring doing it from home and, uh, you know, sort of on the job work sort of, you know, it's it's all trial and error and there's different you know, creating fine fragrances is almost a different skill to creating perfumes that go into products. It's It can be a bit more technical. So did you find yourself at some point actually thinking, right, I've got to go off and smell some of these classics. I've got to smell some of the old French perfumes from the 20s and 30s. And, or did you think, no, 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 no. I, I just I just want to be my own person and, and do my own thing. I think I wanted to be more my own person and do my own thing. I think, um, you know, obviously the classics are to be respected. Um, but, you know, here at Lush, we don't tend to, you know, we're very fortunate and very lucky that we can really create what we want. So um, we're not determined by trends. It's not, oh, OK, um, you know, oud is the trend of the moment. We need to create an oud perfume to be out there. You know, we're, we're not sort of. We're not necessarily catering to the mass market. So um, I, I think I tend to not actually smell a lot of different perfumes because I'm so overexposed to smell constantly. You know, I tend to sort of wear fragrance on a weekend. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't I'm not overly I do definitely look at competitors. I had like a sniff um, uh, subscription where I had, uh, right. you know, that would arrive and it's definitely good to see what's out there and what people different people are creating and so now at this point in your career would you call yourself a lush employee who happens to be a perfumer or a perfumer who happens to work at lush <clears throat> oh i'm not sure it's a tricky <laughs> one i mean i was called a novice for quite some time <laughs> um but i think that I mean, obviously, with the Florence collection, I think after that, um, it felt like people would take me more seriously because we live in this lush bubble where everyone, oh, that's amazing, that's lovely, I love it, you know, and and no one really sort of says, oh, you know, I don't, I don't like that, or change this, or you know, so it, it's a very sort of insular process, and because you're in this lush bubble, you don't know what other people within the industry what their perception of your perfumes will be and i think after i received some good um feedback on the florence collection you know i thought no actually i can do this it is still a very insecure feeling when you're creating though almost almost like a sort of imposter syndrome type yeah feeling. is that right yeah so, so for, for how long have you formally been the lush perfumer um, I think it's around seven years now. Um, obviously, okay. I think that's more, obviously, the majority of what I did and what I still do is product perfumery. Um, I think fine fragrance wise, I think it was 2018 or 2019 um, when I released my first perfume, which was junk that went into the perfume libraries. So that was the, the start. Um, so yeah, that was. Yeah. So so uh, you know, even though I think in in many ways Lush is a brand, at least from the perspective of a of a of a regular consumer, is a brand that embraces um, diversity and and liberalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I also sometimes get a sense of it at the top being quite 
male ego driven and I don't necessarily mean that in a sort of judgmental way did you feel you had to kind of wrestle some control away from those male egos and sort of shout a little bit to say look leave this to me this is my job now boys leave it to Emma um no not necessarily um yeah I mean I think there's in any type of perfumery there are definitely <laughs> egos involved um but you know mark is actually i mean obviously he he has an ego um but actually he's not you know one of these sort of boyish people he's very um sort of feminine in his thoughts and his feelings and he's really he's really encouraged me in, within my perfumery because he would always kind of stimulate that creative part of my brain. He would bring me perfumes. He would play pieces of music, um, and I would have to make perfumes based on that. Or um, you know, he just he would he had this book where it just had random pictures, and he would just say, "Okay, April the fifth, that picture, make a perfume that represents that." And that's quite a daunting feeling. But actually, he really sort of pushed me out of my comfort, which allowed me to be creative in that sense. No, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's bring us a little bit closer to the present. Um, whenever I've heard you talk about the Renaissance collection, the Florence collection, I can, I, I can really sense. I hope I'm right. There's the there's, there's sort of pride in your voice when you talk about them as a collection. Uh, I was very fortunate to have gone to uh, Florence in November 2019, which seems like ancient history now. Back back in the day when you didn't think twice about getting on a plane and traveling traveling to Florence, um, I, I was invited by Lush for the for the opening of the Florence uh, perfume shop, and I was very fortunate to meet you and to smell the perfumes in situ. Tell us about how all of that came about and how you decided to go on this concept, uh, not just of making the perfumes, but also relating them to these different moods, um, you know, the sanguine, the melancholic, the choleric, go on, give, a, give, us, give us the spiel on the Renaissance collection. Okay, uh, well, we had uh, a lady that worked with us uh, called Rose, um, and she used to be a former employee at Lush, and she'd been studying in Florence, and she, um, kind of came to Mark with, uh, you know, armfuls of information about uh, the that Renaissance period of time and how they would use different ingredients almost as uh, medicine. You know, you would treat your mood, you would treat your humours. Um, so she kind of, she was the muse of the project and she came with all the information. So, you know, Mark was adamant that we we had to have a shop in Florence um so i kind of had free reign in terms of creativity um one of the things that she um gave to me was a humor wheel which is used now um for the the collection in terms of balancing your humors but my wheel looks slightly different to the one that you see in the spa um and it would just have these different ingredients in different places so for example you would have rose which was on the humor wheel, it was cold and wet. And it was interesting how these ingredients, when you smelt them, they did reference this humor wheel that they used in that period of time. So it was a really interesting uh, concept um, to try and, you know, a, some of the perfumes, like say Sappho, for example, I really think has that, um, it has that, time gone by odor it, it does smell quite vintage it does smell like it would be from that period of time I'm so going to some now actually while you're talking because okay. there's something i wanted to ask you about sappho as well okay. so this is sappho go on so yes absolutely it does have a vintage feel yeah i mean uh, originally the name for that was i wanted to call it the florentine blonde um because there was uh so i had like a leaflet for a leonardo da vinci um exhibition that was happening I, I it wasn't in florence i think it was in milan but i couldn't get to it um so i read through this leaflet and, and it referenced the florentine blonde and it talked about the women of that period where they were trying to dye their hair um a lighter color um so I, you know i thought well i was thinking well these women 
would have opulence. I wanted to try and make it smell opulent. But I also wanted it to represent the women that were shut away at home. Um, you know, would they be smoking cigarettes out on the out of the window of their, you know, their, their little houses and apartments? So you know, the base of it is quite a really heavy aura space, um, with quite a close perfume. Um, so I kind of wanted it to represent both ends of the scale for that one. What is it that gives it that vintage feel, would you say? I'm not sure. I think the tobacco adds definitely adds to it. I think the the oud that you know there's there is a very high level of oud in there i'm pretty sure there's probably um powders in there well that's um, what i'm thinking because it's that kind of powdery feel that to me is what spells vintage yes now the other interesting thing about this one is that uh, unless i'm mistaken this is for 100 mils this is 150 pounds to buy now mm -hmm. it, it, if you're familiar with Lush perfumes, then maybe that doesn't come as a surprise. But I think there are still lots and lots of people out there who would not think that if you were to walk into Lush, you would be expected to part with 150 pounds to buy 100 mils of perfume. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the pricing, you know, for instance, why is it that this one's so expensive? And also, why is it that Lush have decided to place some of their perfumes in, in a pretty expensive sector of the market? Yeah, I think with the Florence collection, um, it kind of, in terms of the, the pricing, so I went through a period of time where I was creating products um, and I had to be more mindful of the cost. So when I got to creating the fragrances for the collection, kind of cost went out of the window. So you'll find that um, obviously the case with Lush is that you're paying for the quality of the material. We're not picking like a random figure out of the air. It is due to the high level of quality ingredients that are in there. It is really heavy on oud. You know, what we say is in there is in there. Um, so I think, you know, we don't market our perfumes. We don't advertise. We don't do all these things. So you're getting a really high quality product. Um, but I think with the Florence collection, because it's a creation, so we're, we're not creating it within a margin of price. We're not thinking, oh, okay, well, for the Florence collection, we need to price this at X and Y to to try and fit something. It we cost it after the creations happened. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think internally everyone was, you know, thrilled that I'd created a perfume that was going to cost people 150 pounds for a bottle um but it is due to the the high level of uh ingredients in there do do you get people are, are you aware do you get people walking into a shop where the, where some of these are stocked and sort of almost balking at the price thinking are you having a laugh you know you <laughs> no not personally because I, I you know obviously i'm not in the shops well they can't put it in the shops because it's so expensive so i haven't heard about that one personally but no, not really. I, I just think sometimes w if you connect to something, if it's your signature scent, you will pay that price. If you love it, you love it. Um, but it's not, we haven't, you know, just used really cheap ingredients and then just decided to do, you know, a pricing grid where we put this one at the top. Um, but yeah, I can understand that people feel that way. I mean, that's what we tried to do with the, so we've got a Renaissance discovery set. So this was a chance to have, this is a chance to have four of the collection in a really good size of 15 mil um, for, I think it was 99 pounds. So that was an opportunity to try and sample. It was almost, we try, we always try to find a way of how can we sample without it being these little, naff little spray bottles we want you to really experience it um so th this was kind of our way of if you wanted to find what you loved within that collection and commit to that higher level purchase then this is an opportunity for you to experiment yeah and i thought i thought they were very good sample sets i i, I reviewed them in, in another video because you also did them you, you did two other sample sets as well didn't you yeah i know this is a really really awful question and perfumers always say oh but they're like my children but if you had to save one and only one of the renaissance collection from a burning building which one would it be do you think oh that's so tough 
Could I save two? No, let's go with one because I want to spray one now. You, you, Sappho. Sappho's out because we we you'd say okay. So if you if it would be Sappho, I'll let you have another one so I can spray another one. Um, well, confetti would probably be the other one. Confetti, go on. <laughs> tell us about confetti and why confetti. Well, confetti is very personal to me. So um, obviously, at this time when we were armed with all this information about medicinal ingredients, we were creating the Florence collection. Um, one of the so I kind of have a notebook and I I mark down I note down different combinations that I want to try together. So for this one I it was pear, coffee, violet, and rose. So I wanted to play around with that as a combination. Um, so it, it, everything sort of happened at the same time. So at the time I was planning my wedding, but that didn't happen um, because of COVID. Hopefully it happens this year. Um, so that was kind of happening. And then one of the founders, Rowena, she kind of had a sniff and said, oh, that reminds me of sugar almonds, which is the, the little things you have on the table, wedding favors at weddings. Um, and then I was talking to Rose about the creation of this perfume and she said, oh, well, that's perfect for this collection because in times gone by in the Renaissance period, when they would have these you know, important events such as weddings, they would have these huge sugar sculptures um, and these sugar sculptures were called confetti because at the time I didn't have a name for the product. So when we said, oh, the name of the sugar sculpture is confetti, it was like everything just sort of married together. But obviously it's personal to me because at the time I'd picked my wedding dress, my flowers, the theme. So that was all very much in my mind during the, the process. No, absolutely. And, the, and that fruity sweetness yet cut by the, the warmth of the coffee really mm -hmm. comes through, or, or at least it does, it does on the blotter. Tell us how these tie in with the spa treatment. Um, okay, so... I personally really love the spa treatment um, that I don't know if that's biased for me to say, but um, so obviously we wanted to create th the whole purpose. We wanted to create a perfume collection and it was going to be a spa treatment. It was always going to be a spa treatment. So we had musicians in Florence creating the music for the treatment. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's a, it, it's about using the perfume as a medicine so we picked the four perfumes because they were in the humal uh, theory <clears throat> to bring you balance. And um, we, we kind of thought, well, if you spray the perfume into the spa, then that's all you're going to spray. You're just only going to have the final product, so the final perfume. So we decided that we'd uh, layer the perfume up in, in the treatment. So when you get into the room, you climb into a bed. So the bed has been uh, perfumed with a powder which contains the base notes of the ingredient. Then you will have a treatment, so whether it's um, a neck uh, massage or it's a foot treatment, depending on what you pick, that had the, the middle notes of the perfume in a, a massage bar formula and then the top notes were they come out of like a dry eye sensor that's kind of floated above your head at the very end so you build the perfume so at the very end you have that final final perfume wow so yet another reason for us to hope for the current situation to end as quickly as possible so that we can have these <laughs> lush spa treatments again and <laughs> i know i had to um when we came out of lockdown, I had to go and have the treatment with a mask on because obviously it's a perfume treatment. So we just needed to see that you could smell something through the mask. So I did have that treatment, but also I had quite an emotional response the first time I had it. I think I picked uh, Sappho and as part of the treatment at the very end, the therapist kind of says words of affirmation right and next to either side she sort of says something one side and then goes the other side and says something else so I think she said like you're worth it or you're good enough or and I just remember laying there and then like a tear just streamed down my eye and I thought oh but I think it's because it, it's very personal to me I don't expect everybody else to have an emotional emotional response but it is really special 
Yes, go to Lush for a spa treatment, shed a tear. But it, it sounds good, actually. It sounds very cathartic. You can probably imagine lots and lots of people needing to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, at the half hour mark, I should say that if you're watching live or indeed if you're watching the recording, you have tuned in to an interview with me, personally, an interview with Emma Dick, the current in-house perfumer at Lush. And I will say at this point, please send in your questions for Emma. We'll start say, taking questions in a couple of minutes. And like I said at the start of the broadcast, if you're able to say where it is that you're watching from, it's always wonderful to know where in the world you happen, you may happen to be. Um, does, does making perfumes come easily to you, Emma? You don't strike me as the sort of person who would agonize and stress over things, but I could be completely wrong. This could just be a very, very composed facade. <laughs> Um, I, it actually, it comes easier to me than I would expect, than I would have ever thought. Um, a lot of what I do is quite disposable. I don't hang on to it and I don't harbour feelings for it because a lot of the time it will just end up in the bin or it will, you know, it's intended for a product. It hasn't worked in a product. There's no other application for it. It goes in the bin. So, um, it's, but I think, from a fine fragrance perspective, it is definitely, you know, I didn't sleep properly for weeks creating these perfumes. We had such a tight deadline. I think we created, I created these perfumes in the space of six weeks, you know, we had like a six week turnaround to do it. Um, but you're, it's almost like you're trying to activate a, a different part of your brain to, to that. Cause it, the product stuff is more, um, technical and and it kind of it can be quite throwaway but for fine fragrance you have to you have all this uh, different um, information that you have to factor into what you're doing or, or which emotions come into play I think I always find that for that creation process um, it's always good for me to be slightly out of balanced if I'm in a, a sort of okay mood everything's fine but I think when you're frustrated, insecure, sad, sometimes some good stuff can come out of that, mm. um, or even if you're quite euphoric as well. So I think it's that change of mood. Okay, let's go straight into the sort of question that everybody always wants to know the answer to. This is from Anna, who says, I'm curious, what is the best selling lush fragrance of all time? Um, I think it's Karma Fragrance. That is, it's been there from day dot. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, so I had a feeling it would be as well. I think it's closely followed by, um, I think, Dirty Perfume. And, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some others. But yeah, Karma is it is lush it's essentially lush it's absolutely lush but that that is the smell that we all associate with lush isn't it that is the smell that you know where you that's when you know you're close to a lush shop mm -hmm. in response to the spa treatment by the way joanna says planning my trip to pool as soon as we are out of lockdown although i don't know you if you necessarily have to go to pool i know that you did it at the at the oxford street shop didn't you Yes, it's so it's available in all perfume library stores. So if it would be Oxford Street, Liverpool, um, I think those are, I've probably missed some, and, and someone's going to be upset. Well, it'll probably it'll, I'm sure it'll be on on a, on the Lush website. I think like globally there are perfume libraries as well. So you know there are there are different places that you'd be able to experience it. Great, Flackerness says. Uh, what's your favorite Lush perfume scent wise that you, I guess that means what's your favorite Lush product scent wise out of the ones that you haven't created, that you didn't create? I um, I really like Rose Jam in, in different product applications. Um, I like Avo Bath Bath Bomb. It's really simple, um, but still really great. Um, I love Sleepy. I have um, like Sleepy Body Spray you know when the, the kids are quite fraught and I'm on my last nerve I usually just sneak into their room and spritz a few spritz and close the door because it hangs around for ages so when they go to bed I hope that they will sleep and I get to sleep so that's the lavendery yeah. one isn't it yeah it's lavender yeah. in Tonka yeah it's quite a heady mix um Angela's got a question here as a fan of the much missed potion and a huge carnation lover. Does Emma have a carnation forward fragrance in her 
forward fragrance in her arsenal. I don't know Potion, actually. I don't think I, I, I was aware of that one. Yeah, I remember Potion from when I first started. I used to have to fill that into the bottles. Wow. Uh, we sold it, yeah. Um, it was really lovely. Um, I think I've definitely experimented with Carnation. I can't say that I've come up with anything very good, but I will certainly keep that in mind. Because yeah, I really love Potion. I really love that one as well. We did do like a um, like a special. Sometimes we do. It's almost like a forum or a community special where we will put certain lush products into uh, ethanol and make it into a perfume. And Potion is definitely one of those that has been turned into a a perfume and sold a couple of times before. In in terms of how the hierarchy of the company works and how things are structured, who has the final say? on what will go out as a fine fragrance you know do you is, is there a sort of evaluator type person or how, how does that work uh well the evaluator for me is mark so uh he kind of has overall say but also he is he's really good at spotting things that i don't particularly like uh, for something that I've created but he sometimes he can sort of sift through the stuff and and he can find something that you've overlooked um so yeah ultimately he has the final say but obviously when Simon was here and they created perfumes together it was obviously a joint process of you know what what perfumes went forward um I think it became a bit more um to Simon's uh, evaluation you know, with the last Gorilla show. So, um, but ultimately Mark kind of has the final say. So so has there ever been something that you've created and that you've been really, really, really proud of and he's turned around and said, I don't think we can do this because it's just, you know, either because it's just not going to sell or it's just not going to work or? Yeah, I mean, he always tries to, you know, he's not brutal with his opinions and thoughts although sometimes if I make something and he smells it he got oh you know he can recoil in terror um but he no he's he's pretty open to stuff um okay yeah I think uh yeah he's pretty open to stuff a question from Rizwan what's the best tuberose fragrance at Lush um well I'll have to say my own. <laughs> Go on then. No, you're allowed to. <laughs> uh, Frangipani. Because I don't think um, any of the other perfumes at Lush have a strong scent in tuberose. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't pick it as a tuberose scent. So you can definitely pick it up in Frangipani. So I'm, I'm not trying to say that's a plug my own stuff, but you know, you can definitely smell that in there. Whereas I think the other perfumes, uh, you wouldn't be able to detect it really. But this is this is this is the one setting where you are allowed to plug your own stuff. So so okay. you go for it. Um, okay. Thea says, I often find lush fragrance is quite overwhelming. Is there going to be a more subtle range? I mean, I think it's probably fair to say that we don't expect shy wallflowers from lush, do we? No, we don't. No, and I, I think obviously each of us have our own style. I'd like to think that. Um, my collection were slightly more subtle. They're definitely, I I made them with a view that I wanted to love them and I wanted to wear them and I wear them. Um, you know, it's just different styles. I, I think Simon creates these big, bold, and Mark, these big, bold art house type fragrances. They can be really strong, um, but it's, it, it's, I mean, it's not necessarily to everybody's taste, but there's definitely people that can appreciate the um, the formulation. Um, and, you know, Mark's really good at sort of classic smelling perfumes. They can be quite strong, some of theirs, or they have been, and also downright bizarre. I don't yeah. think I've smelt anything yet but made by you that is really, really weird, or would you disagree? No, I haven't done anything really strange. I haven't created a, a Lord of Goat Horn. Um, but, you know, I'm sort of, I'm still evolving in the process. Although I've been around, um, you know, fragrances in Lush for a long time, 
this is kind of my evolution. Who who's to say what I'm going to create uh, for the next one? And I think maybe maybe I played it a little bit safe with the Renaissance collection. They were, you know, they are they are. I think that they're they're nice. They're not making a bold statement about anything. Um, but who's to say that I, you know that's not something that I create in the future? Okay, well, what, what are some of your favourites from Lush's past? The fine fragrances not made by by you. Um, I really like uh, Simon's Secret Garden. Okay. So we had it at a gorilla show, um, and it was uh, like a gallery exclusive. And then we sold it in the perfume libraries. I really love it because um, it's really strong with osmanthus. I, I really like osmanthus. That's definitely one of my favourites. Um, I liked. Um, I love smell of weather turning. Oh, I think I know. I think I've brought Smell of Freedom out today rather than, although I do have Smell of Weather Turning, which is another really intriguing one, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, that's definitely one of my favorites. And I think it was enhanced by the show that we were at. We had, you know, each of the collections kind of had a show or a, a thing, like an association to the scent. Um, that was definitely a favorite of mine. Um, do you think, do you, um, because because it, it, it's very, I still get people who are surprised when I tell them that, you know, oh, I've just received a sample from Lush or what are you wearing? I'm wearing a Lush perfume. Do you, do you think there is still this lack of awareness out there that you guys make perfume and that you have done so actually for a very long time? Yes, they're, they're definitely not. You know, we're, everyone... If I speak to anyone, they say, oh, you know, is that the smelly soap shop or is that the bath bomb shop? So, you know, obviously we create these products and they're great. Um, but I think, you know, especially in the last maybe two to four years, we're, we're certainly trying to push the message that, yes, we are the smelly soap shop. We are the bath bomb shop. But, you know, we... Everything that we do is really individual and creative. We have full freedom. We, you know, we we create perfumes and people are shocked when you say we create perfumes. And I don't know whether that's because the displays of perfume are tucked away at the back of the store. You know, it's it's harder to sell a perfume than it is to sell a product. But um yeah, people just need to um go and have a sense. And I just wonder as well sometimes about how you pitch their their identity because lush perfumes have gone through quite a few different incarnations you know we we talked to you you talked about be never too busy to be beautiful then for for a long time they were called gorilla perfumes which had a, a certain feel to them now they're very much under the lush banner and i think they're looking more serious than they ever have done before you know standard uniform bottles with black caps black labels and yet the names seem to be aiming at a kind of quirkiness. So, you know, you'll still have a perfume called Keep It Fluffy. You'll have a perfume called Fresh As. Do you have discussions at Lush where you think, how are we going to pitch this? What do we want people to think the, the, the mood and the tone and the identity of our perfumes is? Well, I think, you know, we may have standardised the look um, and the sizing of the bottles, it yeah, like you say, it looks more. It definitely looks more serious, but there is still that quirkiness there with those um, those names. And I mean, I can't speak on behalf of Mark and, and Simon, but I know that when the the previous Gorilla um, shows that they did, this was like almost like an album. It was like releasing an album. And I think you know their their perfumery changed and evolved and their relationship changed and evolved in, in that process so i think that's why it's you know they they were always trying to keep it fresh and exciting um and that's not to say that it won't ever go you know slightly back in that direction but i think for now we just we need people to know that we're here and you know we're making some really good stuff or try it you know there's been a really there's been a rise of niche brands and, you know, we are kind of like the niche brand of the mass market. You know, we, we're very um, individual in what we're doing and what we're creating. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's just the evolution of perfume through Lush really. 
No, it's perfect you said that because there's another question here from Sam's Watches saying, are Lush perfumes considered niche perfumes or is it something else? Now, I I know what my my answer to that would be, but this is all about your answer. So you, you used an interesting phrase there now, the niche of the mass market, which you, yeah. you could almost say is a contradiction in terms. So what do you mean? Well, I remember having a conversation with Simon and, uh, you know, we were and he we were talking about niche brands and... I kind of said to him that, but are we niche? Because a niche brand is a much smaller uh, commodity than what we are. We're, we, you know, this is a multi-million pound company. So actually we could, maybe the, the concept and the idea and the creation is niche, but actually we, we are in, you know quite a large market obviously we sell our perfumes within our own retail stores and online so you're not going to find us in the airport you, you know so we're not we're not mass market in that way you can't find us in boots or the perfume shop or anything like that um it is all created and and sold in our own stores so it's it's it, it i don't know it's like a little bit conflicting because the the process and the thought is niche but actually there is a customer base there that can buy it and will buy it. So it's much bigger than, you know, some of the other smaller brands. Mm. Very, very specific question here next from Dev. Will cardamom and coffee ever come back? Never say never. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed it, but it, it wasn't as popular as um, we necessarily anticipated. The story was great. Um, if people buy it or want it or ask for it, it'll come back. I mean, we're quite unique in that we we can um, facilitate people's needs. Um, so if, if people are calling for it, then we'll bring it back. So send enough messages out there. Yeah. A question here, again, very specific from Dragia. I love the soap, honey, I wash the kids. What fragrance is closest to that smell, if any? Um, I'm not sure that there is. We had a body <laughs> spray called turmeric latte. Um, I've still got a bottle of that somewhere, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's a shameless plug again. Um, that is probably the closest, just purely because it's those sort of caramel notes. Um, we do have a honey I washed body spray, you can buy that as a body spray. Um, I, I I don't think there's anything that, that is that close. It's quite unique. They're, they're almost as good as fine fragrances, those body sprays anyway. I know that one person here, I would imagine maybe is thinking that the Windex looking bottles for those are. Do they, do they still come in those Windexy type bottles? The, the body spray. spray bottles, yeah. I think yeah. Um, in, in its original form it was sold in uh be never too busy to be beautiful so there was a range of products that supported um dirty body spray and actually it was in like a white bottle which was the the window cleaner um you know the window lean type bottle the windex yeah. bottle, um but in white so it very much looked like a you know a, a antibacterial spray or a, a floor cleaner or something like that um, and that was the intent. That was the purpose behind it. But then I think when we, when Be Never Too Busy to Be Beautiful closed and we wanted to keep that fragrance within, we then tried to make it look more lush, obviously with our, you know, in line with our black pots and, and everything else. It would have sort of stuck out like a sore thumb. Although I think, is it Moschino or someone is doing uh, like a spray bottle that's quite similar? So yes. maybe that inspired them. <laughs> you never know. David here would obviously like to have a doubt put to rest. He says, I remember Twilight changed to Sleepy and now it's back as Twilight. But to my nose, it's different from the original Twilight I tried. I sense an oatmeal kind of smell in the new one. So is David right? What's going on? I'm very glad he asked this question because this comes <laughs> up quite a lot internally, <laughs> like with Lush fans. They are exactly the same. They are so how exactly do you explain how do you explain the perception difference then? I don't know. I think sometimes it, it it's a similar thing where if you um, if you smelt the same thing but out of different coloured bottles, you would have a different perception of how it smells. So Twilight, it, it just happens to be that the Twilight bath bomb was created. 
but it is still the sleepy perfume. Um, and we kind of opened up a debate online. Should we keep it as, uh, should we keep it as twilight body spray? Should we change it to sleepy? And everyone was saying, no, you can't change it to that because it's different. And we're like, no, it's, it's literally exactly the same. There is no difference. So it's just a perception thing. Absolutely. And there's a lot of research being done that even though you don't change the product, but you change one color on the packaging, mm -hmm. it has a very, very marked effect on perception. Yeah. And I think we'll finish off the contributions from, from the viewers. Thank you very much for all the contributions, by the way, with uh, the compliment from Audrey, who says, I just want to say the sales advisors in Lush are fantastic. They know their products inside out. Certainly my experience with Lush has always been that the people who work there are, are um, exemplary. You, you seem to get real characters very often at, 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 in, in the nicest possible way. So thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. Most of all, obviously, thank you to you, Emma, for making the time, uh, for coming along, for joining us live from Pool. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll leave I'll, uh, one final question. When the day comes that we're out of the current situation and sooner or later that day will come, how do you think our relationship with perfume will have changed? Do you think people will be seeking out different sorts of perfumes, different sorts of smells? Yeah, I think potentially. I think people will probably be a bit more experimental. Um, I don't know how much people are using perfume um, during the lockdown if they're at home, um, but maybe they want to indulge, uh, you know, when they, they start to go out and liberate themselves. Um, yeah, I think, you know, customers are definitely becoming more informed about what they're buying and why they're buying it. Um, so I think, you know, people are, are more educated. So I think that, yeah, they'll just, they'll find a different relationship. I think it, hopefully people start to, you know, feel a certain way when they wear a perfume. If I, if I spray Nero, for example, I want to feel powerful that day. I want to feel in charge. So I think, you know, it's quite transformative of your mood. So I think, yeah, I hope that people will be out there experimenting as much as they can. Yeah, so a period of a sort of reaction to the lockdown. I think that may well be the case. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Huge thanks to you, Emma. And stay tuned to social media for details of more interviews coming up in the weeks and months to come. So final word to you, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, stay safe. See you all soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.